Welcome to Know This Live. I'm Zinkley Esamwa. In the wake of the 2020 election's record turnout, 43 states are proposing more than 250 bills to restrict voting rights. According to the Brennan Center, which is tracking the proposals, many of them are rooted in racism and baseless allegations of voter fraud. Republican lawmakers have been openly scrambling to enact laws that make it harder for people to vote. And Democrats are taking notice. Joining me today is Jamie Harrison, the chairman of the Democratic National Committee. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, and I want to jump right in. I know that many of these new proposals are aimed at restricting voting. Even in Georgia this week, we saw a GOP-led bill um, that would limit absentee and in-person voting, and that was passed. Knowing all of this, how do you plan to combat this and make sure the most amount of people have their voices heard at the ballot box? Well, what we're seeing, and let's be clear about this, is Jim Crow uh, 2.0. Uh, the, the Republicans are even as bad as saying that it will be a misdemeanor for anyone who feeds someone who's standing on a voter line uh, in, in Georgia. I mean, that is absolutely ridiculous. And so the DNC is going to fight hard against all of this, and we're going to utilize every tool in our toolbox to fight Republican efforts to suppress or restrict voting in this country. Um, you know, the efforts that we see in our state legislatures are not just concerning, but they're threatening our fundamental right as Americans. And so we are going to challenge these in state legislatures. If we lose there, we will challenge them in courts. And at the same time, uh, we are in full support of H.R. 1 and S. 1, the For the People Act legislation that is going through Congress that will go after a number of these measures uh, uh, against suppression of, of, of voters. And so we're looking forward to give our whole support to that legislation to move forward. And I know that the Supreme Court also just heard arguments this week on a case that centers on the Voting Rights Act, specifically around communities of color uh, and voting restrictions surrounding those communities. Knowing that, um, when a justice asked during that case what interest the Arizona RNC has in the case, a lawyer said, and I quote, because it puts us at a competitive disadvantage relative to Democrats. What's your reaction to that? This is all about politics for them. Look, in the end of the day, uh, voting is about getting into the square and putting up the, the merits of your policy and your ideas up against the other side. We are happy to do that. You know, I, I, I tell folks all the time, yes, I want more Democrats to vote, but I just want Americans to vote. Uh, and that's what's really important. But what we see on the other side of the aisle in terms of the Republicans, they know that their policies are failures. They know that their candidates are duds. And therefore, the only way that they can win is if they cheat. And that is what we're seeing right now, fundamental cheating. You know, we send our sons and daughters overseas to fight for democracy and the right to vote in other countries. And the Republicans do everything in their power here to uh, keep that right away from Americans. That's not right, and we're not going to stand for it. And when it comes to wins and losses between party lines, I'm sensitive to the fact the Democrats were hoping to expand control in the House in 2020. Instead, uh, it ended up shrinking the majority in 2020. Knowing that, what is your plan for keeping control in 2022? Well, it's about doing what we know that works, organizing, organizing, and organizing. That's what works. It w worked in Georgia. It worked, if, if you take a look at it, I mean, since 2018, we have won the House. We have won the United States Senate. We have won the White House. And what we need to do is add to those gains in order to make sure that our majority is an operating majority, where we have enough votes to get all of the things that we need to get done, and we can lose a, a vote or two from a Democrat in the Senate or lose a few votes in the, in the House of Representatives and still move our agenda, our unified agenda forward. And so that's what we're looking at doing. We're going to organize. We're going to focus on registration to get more voters registered to vote. Uh, and then we're going to educate and mobilize those voters going into 2022. So I'm really, really uh, excited about the prospects. And it is notable that you said, right, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. I am mindful that there have been divisions among Democrats, right, even with the COVID-19 relief bill when it comes to issues of minimum wage, when it comes to the relief package, there has been a split. Knowing that, how do you unify? Well, it's, it's you know, the big thing is, is understanding this. You know, one of my first jobs in politics was the floor director in the majority whip's office. 
Uh, we had a 15 seat majority in the House of Representatives and an extremely diverse caucus. Uh, 50 Blue Dog members, 40 CBC members, 100 progressive members. But we never lost a party line vote on the floor. And that's part, part of, the, of the notion is to understand that we are a diverse party that reflects the diversity of this great nation in all aspects. Does that mean we're going to be always on the same page on everything? No. But if we can find common ground, as I like to say, the paths we all take may be different, but hopefully the destination is the same. How can we make this a better place for all, all of America's people? And that's where we have to find that common ground and move forward on it. And we'll do that. We just need to make sure that we have enough of a majority uh, so that you don't have to be unified on every single vote uh, every single time. And so um, uh, I'm looking forward to, to growing that majority and giving us a little more uh, some elbow room uh, to, to do what we need to do to get legislation passed. And one more question on the piece about divisiveness when it comes to legislation. I'm mindful also of, of course, the minimum wage with some more progressive Democrats saying, if we can't pass it now, when are we ever going to be able to pass it? What conversations are happening internally? Yeah. Well, you know, the last time the minimum wage passed, again, I was the floor director in the whip's office, and we were able to work not only with Democrats to get them unified, but we also worked with Republicans to get it done. And it was George W. Bush who actually signed the bill once we were able to do that. Uh, I, I do not believe that the minimum wage is dead. I think we're going to continue to work hard with this president and with Congress in order to get it done because it's time to get it done. Uh, it is way past time. And so, uh, again, there's going to be some give and take uh, uh, in, in order to get it through, particularly as long as uh, Republicans can continue to filibuster. Um, but we will find a way and a path for it because the American people def definitely deserve it and they need it. And you referenced your Republican colleagues. I know that last week um, w the Republicans had a lineup at CPAC of their rising stars. And it's pretty evident that there are a number of people on the Republican side that are making a splash. Uh, knowing that, who in the Democratic Party is being groomed uh, to be the future or present sort of rising stars? Oh, we have so many stars in, in, in our party right now. And, and I don't want to get in trouble by starting to name some of them. But I mean, uh, let's take a look at the 2022 race. Uh, I can tell you one of the brightest stars we have is Stacey Abrams and what she was able to do in Georgia. Uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, I'm hoping that she decides to run for a governor again. And if so, uh, I'm looking forward to calling her governor uh, in, in the near term. So uh, again, a number of stars out in our party who are doing great things all across the country in all 50 states. And this party, the DNC, will be right there with them to make sure that they have the resources and the foundation to succeed and do good stuff for the people of this great nation. And I know the Democratic Party has been criticized in the past for not having sort of a standing bench of up and coming uh, leaders for the party. How do you intend to change that? Well, you know, just like I did in South Carolina, uh, you know, I created a fellowship in my home state uh, because I saw that we didn't have a bench. We didn't have a bench for uh, young and diverse campaign operatives or county party leaders or even candidates themselves. We created a fellowship called the James E. Clyburn Political Fellowship. We've trained almost 150 people from across uh, the state of South Carolina in all 46 counties, and they are now running for office. They are they're running for Congress. They're running for state house and state senate, county council and city council. They are making a difference in the, the political landscape in the state. We're going to do the same thing on a national level at the DNC, and I'm excited about that prospect. Well, Jamie Harrison, the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, and thanks to everyone for tuning in. This has been Know This Live. I'm Zinclay Esamois.